this young man, right, first of all, the shoes, bro, come here, man. See, if y'all don't understand, if y'all don't understand how to work, you see what I'm saying, bro? That's what I'm talking about. Don't worry about it. We'll be having a class later on, all right? Y'all just, like, y'all be down here. We got a Mac level that you can't understand. So we were chatting, and I asked, as always, tell me something cool. And this young man, aside from doing these kind of fancy things, cook for 20 years, a chef. I almost said cook, a chef. His specialty, the lobster roll. Ooh, I know. That's, I'm serious. He has this cool picture. Ask him on Twitter to show you the cool picture. It was what, how long were they? Two feet of lobster roll. Right, amazing. This guy's tremendous. Now, I don't know what he's going to talk to you all about, but the food looked great. Right? <laughs> and if you notice, his T-shirt says lobster. lobster. I can do that. I like that. See, there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, bang your hands together. Make some noise for Portland, Maine's very own Todd Libby. Thank you. All right. The incomparable Mr. Kenneth LaFrance, everybody. Give a big hand. So, as you can see, my talk today is making a strong case for accessibility at your organization. Tips, tricks I've used over the past 23 plus years on how I get organizations to buy in or better their accessibility. Uh, quick question, quick polls here. How many of you have a family member or friend who has a disability? Okay, a few hands. How many of you work at an organization that practices accessibility? A few hands. How many of you are at an organization that does not practice accessibility? Okay. Thank you, Magnolia, JS, Kayla, Richard, for having me. It's been a blast so far. I look forward to day two. Thank you to the sponsors. Without those gracious companies, I couldn't be able to do this. And thank you and thank everybody out there for attending. I appreciate it. Listen to me babble for about 30 to 45 minutes. I come from the great state of Maine. And now I live in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> I went from 70 and sunny to 115 and hot. My sweat sweats. <laughs> I love lobster. If you couldn't tell, I love lobster. Maine is known for our lobster. So again, a little bit about me. W3 invi invited expert on accessibility, working on WCAG 3, which is three to five years from now. I've done 23 years, developer design, senior accessibility engineer, host of my own podcast, and I stream on Twitch, doing accessibility streams and some other stuff as well, learning in public. How do we do this accessibility thing? I use the data to advocate. And I go to the Web A Million report. There's a link on the bottom. One million websites in the report that they uh, test and scan. 50.8 million accessibility errors. That's a lot. That's down a little bit, but I'd like to see more of a number there having decreased. It just shows me that our web I'm talking digital accessibility here, webs, apps, anything, is very inaccessible to disabled users. 887 elements per home page up to 955. So that means, that tells me, home pages are getting more complex. That's up again. And 5.3% of all those million websites on the home pages had a detected accessibility error. 
of some sort. 96.8% of those websites had a WCAG 2 failure or failures. What are those failures? Low contrast of text. Can anybody tell me what that says? Yes, there are labels in there. No, I do not have invisible ink on that. Abuse and spam. Something isn't right here. And general feedback. The abuse is this contrast of text. Something definitely isn't right here. And my general feedback is, this is shit. <laughs> here are the WCAG guidelines for the minimum contrast of text, which is text and images of text has a contrast ratio of at least 4.5 to 1. There are other considerations for other types of contrast of text. I'm using this as an example, the level double A. That text you saw on those questions, on those buttons, was 1.1 to 1. The scale starts at 1 to 1. So that's barely readable. Another one is missing alternative text. How many of you know of alternative text in images? Okay. Images for screen reader users should have alternative text describing the image to those screen reader users or users of other assistive technologies. This alternative of spam, yes, mm. I remember like it was yesterday. <laughs> so what we have here is no alt text. You usually find this if you do an audit like I have over the past 20 some odd years, I find a lot of that. This is okay because this can be used on a decorative image. And if you'd like to know more about the different types of images that you can use on the, on the web, feel free to ask questions after the talk. This would be Todd's lobster roll, hot butter, and blueberry soda. Perfect. That's concise and it, and it conveys what's in the image. But we don't have enough of this right here. And if you've ever, you know, if you're on Twitter, like I am, and you see images and they don't have that little alt in the bottom left corner, that means there's no alternative text for those users of assistive technologies to find out what is that image, what is the content of that image. Here's a good example of alt text. It's from the, uh, NASA, the James, uh, James Webb Telescope. This is long. Now, there's different schools of thought with alternative text. I'm not going to explain that because I don't want to put everybody to sleep. This, however, is good. This is really, really good. I was very impressed by this. This conveys this image. This is, this is great. And this is where you see that all on Twitter anyways. Concise and conveys the meaning of the picture is what we want. So other, the top six issues for the fourth straight year, I believe, are these. Somebody asked me, what is the most important one on that list to you? And I said, this one right here, the missing document language. Missing document language, the document attribute tells the screen reader or other assistive technology, read this out in this language to the user. And if you have a page in English, that has some blocks of text in Spanish, and you use the alternative text on those paragraphs that are in Spanish, the screen reader will, per, will announce that paragraph in that language for that user. That's why I think this is very important. That's the first thing you see 
when you look at source code on a web page. That is your starting point. Those six amounted to that percentage right there, 96.5% of all sites tested in that report had errors of accessibility. It's way too much. 90, it's, it's estimated that 99% of the web is, is inaccessible. So some low hanging fruit. The most important one on here, for me anyways, is making sure that a website or an app is keyboard or screen reader accessible. We do not want to shut out disabled users. Who do you want to exclude? Ask yourself that. Who do you want to exclude from using your product? Disability is just blind, deaf, or paralysis, right? We have learning and cognitive disabilities. We have ADD and ADHD. We have fibromyalgia, arthritis, tremors, Parkinson's. I am part of this club right here. How many of you have migraine headaches? No, I'm the only one in this room who gets migraine headaches. They're not fun. I can't look at a web page when I have a migraine. I can't do my work when I have a migraine. I can't look at animation. Animation will trigger a migraine headache. Flashing content will cause a migraine headache. Then we have these, stuff that a lot of people never heard of. Users or people that you know browse the internet may have this and you know, or use an app. They want to be included, but we are, as a whole, on the web, excluding these people. And we can't do that. So some excuses. The client doesn't have the budget for it. Yes, they do. Because you put that budget in the contract you put accessibility in that contract. We will make this site accessible. We will make this app accessible. We will make this project accessible. We will do that from the very start, but because when you do it from the very start, when you get those people together and talk about it before you even get that project rolling to design, you're including everybody. We'll get to it after launch. That's kind of like saying, I'll get to the yard work after lunch. I'm always taking a nap after lunch. That's probably the worst time to think about accessibility is after the project is done because you've excluded people. So here are some other hits. Why do we even need to make this thing accessible? Because not everybody does not have a disability. There's no time to do it. Put it in the contract. Make the time. We, <laughs> this is a great one. We don't have disabled users. That was asked, or that was told to me by a guy that was wearing eyeglasses. I said, your eyeglasses are an assistive technology, sir. You are wrong. <laughs> and then he went on to say, the people that use our product are not disabled. And I said, again, sir, you are wrong. What if Susan goes into work one day, she goes to log in to the back end, and she has a broken hand, broken finger, broken arm? That's a situational disability. This one really pissed me off. It's a huge waste of time. That just tells me right there, you do not care about disabled users, you have no empathy towards disabled users, and you probably shouldn't be doing what you are doing. 
that cause this? <laughs> As I looked the CEO right in the face, for, oh, you know, that's a little like that, except I didn't have that dress on that day. <laughs> and then it turned into that. So, let's line those lobsters up in a row, everybody. What do we do? Support from the top. You get support from that C-suite, that CEO, that CIO, that CTO, that C-whatever-O, E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> That's going to trickle down to the rest of the organization from top to bottom. You do it from the start. You do it before the project goes to design. Your developers are going to be really happy because they don't have to go back and reinvent the wheel. Your designers are going to be really happy because they're not going to have to go back and fix and adjust the design. It's going to be less stress. You're going to pay your people less money. I mean, it's a win-win. Why aren't we doing it? Then I've used this one. How many of you have heard of the Domino's Pizza Loss? A few of you. Domino's Pizza, their app and their website, a blind man tried to access their app and their website. Could not. It was inaccessible. He ended up suing. Domino's Pizza spent uh, $38,000 internally to fix this. What did they do? Just like every other company, they took it to court and they appealed. They appealed three to four times. They spent seven figures appealing and they still lost. So I used the Domino's Pizza card. Well, do you want to be sued like Domino's Pizza? Sued? Oh, that perks up a CEO's ears real fast. And then live testing with disabled users recorded on video. I've done this. I personally have people in my family with disabilities. The look of frustration, of giving, of wanting to give up, of anger, of any, you know, the gamut of emotion. Because they can't access that website, that web app, or whatnot. And then I pull out the cash card because, you know, C-suite, they love money. Say, for instance, this corporation sells zippers worldwide. Well, you're missing out on $8 trillion of worldwide disposable income on individuals with disabilities. <gasps> oh, I want a piece of that pie. In this country alone, $490 billion disposable income from people with disabilities. <gasps> I want that piece of pie. Advocates. We need advocates in organizations. Whether you have one advocate or you have an advocate in each team, that's going to foster that accessibility culture. You know, have that person as a liaison. Have those people from each team as a liaison meeting monthly, meeting weekly to make that product, make that brand, make that whatever you have, that project accessible. Assessing the organization. How accessible is it? How inclusive is it? I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard, oh, we don't know how accessible this is. They have done testing. What is the current state of the product? You know, what do they know about WCAG, the guidelines for accessibility? Do they even know about them? How much training will you need? There are ways get this training to your people. 
record the training, have those people that can answer those questions, like myself at organizations who are there to help others, developers, designers, make things accessible. There are organizations like these three, for instance, who will do training for your organization. The guidelines, do you know the guidelines? Do you have an accessible design system? If you do, you're one step ahead of the game. Accessible components, testing, there is accessibility testing that you can do from the back end to make sure things are accessible. And then document those guidelines to help others in that organization. Standards, there are a lot of standards all over the world. These are some of them. We have the ADA. And if you know a little bit, or even if you know they exist, you're one step ahead of the game. The last one here, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is from the United Nations, which the TLDR of it is the internet is a basic human right. And it should be, but as it is now, it is not. Hiring disabled people. I have gone to many organizations and said, do you have disabled people working for you? No. Like, you know, we got two white guys that uh, know how to run a screen reader, kinda. That ain't gonna cut it. I learn from these people. I learn from people with disabilities. So for instance, an example, I read a screen reader at 1.5 times the speed. I know blind people that read it at six times the speed and I am completely lost when they turn it on. They are intelligent people, they are hardworking people, and boy don't they know a thing or two about the assistive technologies they use much more than I could ever know. Use these, uh, oops, use these companies right here for outsourcing testing. Present all these findings to your uh, CEOs, your C-suite. Those, you know, again, those people that can teach and they can advocate and over the time that I've been doing this, I have learned a ton from these people. And this is why I do what I do. I go around and I speak about stuff like this. Maintenance, accessibility is never done. It's evolving like the web. I'm going to explain how that is in a few minutes. So you do annual audits, you do monthly audits, you make sure you're releasing things that are screen reader, um, you know, they, they, they work on a screen reader. You test and with every new release or new change or major change. People out there, the people on the other side of the glass depend on it. So what do we do? We do the work and it is hard work. So if you want to get into accessibility, you might end up with a few gray hairs like I have. But do not be afraid. So Jeffrey Zeldman, I don't know, how many of you know of Jeffrey Zeldman? I see one, two hands. Okay. Visit his website. Read a little bit into it, and you'll know why I have this quote up here. So basically this quote says, as an industry, 
the web, we have never had an A game at talking about or doing accessibility. And basically, we over engineer everything. Maybe not everything, but problems that don't exist are over engineered. And I thought that was a great quote. And then there's this. So I'll leave this up here for a couple minutes. This line right here, the third line, really hit me because I know people that have felt this before and this resonated with me. When you, something is not accessible, you're telling that person you are not welcome in this world and that pisses me off. That fuels me for doing what I do, which is why I advocate for people like the people in my family that do not have a voice. I tweeted this out and boy, didn't this ruffle a few feathers. Design and develop for people not like yourself and keep that in mind when throwing words like inclusive and accessible around because we all like to see companies throw the hashtags out when it's World Accessibility Day, for instance. Oh, we're going to make things accessible. Yeah, but your tweet with the image in your tweet doesn't have alt text on it. That's not accessible. And it's definitely not inclusive. Here's what I wanted to talk about. How many of you have heard about accessibility overlays? Perfect. One, I see one. A CEO told me this. We use an accessibility overlay. We're okay. Two days later, he got two lawsuit threats. Three days later, he called me up and emailed me asking me, I need your help. And I'll explain why. Right there. It's a marketing scam. It's a marketing ploy. It's just making these companies money. And it's snake oil. Please do not look at the uh, logo up here. Wink, wink. These are some of the companies that you will find who are peddling this smut, as I call it. Maybe that's too harsh. Peddling the snake oil. So this line of code, it's one line, usually one line of code, does not make your site accessible because just like this code does not make your website fully accessible. Me putting on a pair of Nikes does not make me Michael Jordan. I'm way past my prime on that. Accessibility is a right, not a privilege. There's a t-shirt for that too. Proceeds go to uh, nonprofit accessibility organizations and um, charities. So I want to real quick here, this um, quote right here, the power of the web is in its universality, accessed by everyone regardless of disabilities as essential, an essential aspect from Uncle Timbo. If you want to come see an overlay and how it does not work, feel free to come see me after and I'll show you why it does not work. I'd be interested, especially with people that have things like ADHD or anything that, you know, you get anxious, you get like me, you have anxiety, you know, come see me and I'll show you 
how these things do not work. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your time and being here and listening and out there as well in the Discord. Thank you very much. <laughs>